Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is a clip from my Bruce Dickinson interview with producer Jack and Dino. If you want to see that interview, it's linked below. So after producing Bruce Dickinson's solo record in 1995, when was the next time you saw him? Two or three years after I made the record, he actually came through the Seattle area doing a solo tour. This was before he rejoined Iron Maiden. This is the irony. He ended up inviting Adrian Smith to join his band later. Now, Adrian Smith was one of the other Iron Maiden guitar players who had left Iron Maiden shortly after Bruce Dickinson left Iron Maiden. So he ends up playing in Bruce Dickinson's band, and then Bruce Dickinson makes a couple of records that at the time sounded more like Iron Maiden than the Iron Maiden records that were coming out then with Blaze Bailey on vocals, actually. I could sort of see where this was going, and sure enough, a couple years later, Bruce is back in Iron Maiden, and they're playing stadiums again. Now, this is a funny story, because... Around the same time, Iron Maiden came to Seattle with Blaze Bailey on vocals. And again, I was like, hmm, I think I need to see this. Now, in 1984, I saw Iron Maiden play at a stadium here in Seattle. It was the Peace of Mind tour. It was huge. It was Iron Maiden, Saxon, and Fastway. It was one of the last, you know, giant concerts that I went to before I became, you know, embedded in the music scene and playing in bands and making records. So Iron Maiden comes through Seattle and they're playing a club show. And it was in the late 90s, and they had Blaze Bailey on vocals. And it's a club show. It's a club here in Seattle uh, where, really? you know, I've played shows at this club. It only holds like 300 people. I'm very surprised to hear that. They weren't playing stadiums. I mean, in the U.S., they were they were off there. I mean, I don't think they were even on EMI anymore at that point. Um, possibly Sanctuary themselves were putting out the records. I'm not quite clear on that. I'd have to go back and look. But... They came through town and they played at a club. And, you know, again, I called up Sanctuary in London. I was like, you know, can I get on the guest list for this? And, you know, Merck put me on the list. And, you know, I got to show up at the club and say, hey, I'm on the guest list for this. And they're like, sure you are, buddy. And like, oh, you are. Okay. So I get in and it's crazy packed. It was so far over capacity. It was way beyond legal capacity. It was elbow to elbow. And they had a giant semi truck parked in front in front of this club you know, with all this gear crammed into this little club. It was insane. And um, I did, I saw like about half an hour of the show and then I just had to leave. It was way too many people in a tiny club. So fast forward a couple years, Bruce is back in the band and Iron Maiden is playing at the Tacoma Dome, which is this freaking mm -hmm. humongous, you know, giant covered stadium here again. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I see where this was had, you know, this is where this had to go, you know? So, you know, Maiden is back on top and, you know, they don't do clubs anymore, but and neither, yeah, does, yeah. neither does Bruce, you know. So I got to see both of them playing in clubs during the uh, the wilderness years, if you will. That's crazy. I actually did an interview with Blaze Bailey about two and a half years ago. You know, what was really interesting was when I was talking to him, I was going to ask him about Maiden at one point, but cool enough, he actually brought it up himself. And he mentioned that he was surprised when he got the word he was no longer in the band. You know what? I thought he sounded pretty good on the Paul Diano tunes. He was great. You know what I mean? When they did the old stuff, the, the Paul Diano tunes, he was he was nailed. And then but when they tried to do the Bruce Dickinson stuff, it wasn't quite as convincing, you know what I mean? Because he doesn't have that range. So, you know, I was like, okay, I see why they got this guy. He's more like Paul Diano. But uh yeah anyway, it is what it is, you know. So Jack, when you were producing this Bruce Dickinson solo record in nineteen ninety five, did Bruce ever talk to you about why he left Iron Maiden? To hear Bruce tell it, he just wanted some more, I think he felt like, you know, he wanted a little more freedom to do stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe he was just a little burned out on it. I mean, at that point, you know, when he left Iron Maiden, it had been like, what, over a decade, maybe 10, 12 years or something like that. And mm -hmm. he just needed to do something else with his life. And maybe, you know, the whole... Uh, you know, he wanted to get off the off the, the the you know the touring sort of grind for a while and just explore some other things. But you know what I mean? I don't think he had any animosity toward anyone in the band. He was still on good terms with everybody. I mean, I met a couple of the Iron Maiden guys while we were there. Uh, we borrowed a snare drum from Nico, and uh, and I met Dave Dave Murray at one point, and he was a lovely fellow. You know, Bruce just wanted to try some things and just try some other styles, and you know, just write some more music and and just do some things that. Now, if you look at the Skunk Works record, for instance, most of the lyrics on it 
are not lyrics that you would expect on an Iron Maiden record, I think, for the most part. You know, his, his lyrics were kind of, you know, it was just all over the place, really. You know, he had a chance to try different things, and we even, like, distorted his voice on a song. I said, let's give your voice that sort of radio thing. I don't remember what song it was, but it was just like that was obviously the thing to do, you know, and you, you would never do that on a Maiden record, actually. So it just gave him a chance to stretch out. You know, the funny thing, there was a record that never came out. He did some sessions with Keith Olsen before he worked with me. And Keith Olsen's a very famous and very established record producer. And he never let me hear any of it. Um, but I gathered that it was there was something a little more electronic about some of it. But I think ultimately he just decided that that wasn't the right direction for him and nothing came of it. I don't, again, I never got to hear any of it. He just sort of mentioned it to me. I guess, you know, he got along fine with Keith, but it was just like an experiment. And then I was the next experiment and we actually made an, an actual record that got released. So Bruce was stretching. He needed to just, you know, he needed to get some stuff out of his system actually during the 90s and he did. And ultimately his solo stuff started converging more and more back toward the sound of Iron Maiden. Of course, when him and Adrian Smith are in the band, you know, it was kind of like, well, this is almost half of Iron Maiden here, you know. I got to give it to him, you know. He's, he always, um, none of those records were casually made. Hey guys, as mentioned during the interview, I did an interview with Blaze Bailey before. Here's the interview. It was a shock to leave Iron Maiden. It was an absolute shock, you know. Uh, but CD sales are gone. And they wanted a reunion. The record company wanted a reunion. At that time, Deep Purple had a reunion. So Bruce had to come back. The odd thing is, you know, Bruce is such a lovely, lovely bloke. And he's always been very supportive of my career. Uh, we met before Maiden. I knew him before I was involved in Maiden. And after, he's been very kind to me. But it, it's a, it was a difference. It was... Like any big thing that you lose, it's grief. It's a thing that an adjustment to make. You look back and you will go, if only this me could go and tell the 25 year old me this, then I could have saved so much energy because I would have said, oh, don't do this. Don't worry about that. Oh, you should be thinking about this. It, well, yeah, that's one side of it, okay? The, the old me now going to tell him that 25-year-old guy. Here's the problem. That 25-year-old guy will go, Who are you to tell me what to do? Leave me alone. I'm doing my own thing. And I don't want your advice. And that's exactly what happens and exactly what would happen. You know, I took a lot of advice. I spoke to a lot of great people along the way. I had so much help. I haven't been, I haven't got here on my own, but I know that that is the answer to the question. That if you went back in time to talk to yourself, you wouldn't listen to yourself because it takes that kind of confidence and arrogance to actually get through all of those rejections and all of those problems and fight that battle. You you don't want to listen to anybody. You've got to keep going the way that you want to go to make that thing happen. I'm here because I have no choice. I have to do this. It's my life. This is life and death to me. And if I'm not here doing this, I'm not going to be doing anything because I'll be dead. A lot of bands that kind of get to a, a certain level, they give it everything to absolutely, perhaps obsessive to the detriment of any normal life that you could possibly have. People will obsessively get themselves involved in their music, their songwriting and their band. I have never wanted to be famous for the sake of being famous like uh, like we have now TV celebrities and people from Big Brother and reality shows and things like this to be famous for just because they're famous for me it's always been about the music and it's always been about trying to write something important that would be important for me that I could look back on and, and hold on to so even the most cheesy lyric 
and cheesy song that I've ever been involved with. It's in, still something I can look back on and go, you know what? When I wrote that, I meant it, and I'm still proud of it because that was good work when I did it. It's something I could hold on to. So dressing the part was just really being following on with that. Well, this is how I feel. You know, this is this is how I dress. But the most important thing I want people to know me for is my songs and my music uh, uh, and all of that. So if you're just going to dress the part, you're going to get somewhere. And you're going to get there. And then when people come and see you and you're not that good or most of it is going to be on tape, then you're not going to hold their interest and you're going to go back to just being someone who dressed up. But if you've actually got something to offer, if you've got some good songs, if you've worked hard, and if you're a, a reasonable musician and you, you found a way to put your ideas and music together, then perhaps you're going to be someone who dressed up and they've got this really catchy song or they've got this great attitude or something like that. So I think that's the difference. Perhaps it gives people the illusion that you will be famous because you look famous. But there, there is another side to it. It is show business. So there is a part of that. And really, I come from this era of Kiss, Twisted Sister, and when bands used to dress up and all of that, and I like it. When people have an attitude and dress up, I like it much more than what we had in grunge, where people wore clothes that hadn't been washed properly and looked at their feet. After Iron Maiden, it gave me a great opportunity to start my solo career. And Being famous is not really worth anything. It's not important. It's something that is like a cold beer on a hot day. It feels good while the sun is out. But the longer you hold on to it and try and keep that beer as it is, the less delicious it will taste. And enjoy it while it lasts. But it's not the most important thing. Being famous is not important. Being famous doesn't make you a good person. It's important to be a good person and get along with people. It's not important to be famous. So that's how I think of it. I don't, I really think for me, it's important to sing. And the only good side of being famous for that is the fact that, oh, maybe people will recognize the name and perhaps they may think I'm worth seeing. They may come to my concert because they've heard of me. But it's not really worth anything more than that to me. I can walk around most places now and hardly be recognised in some countries I can't walk anywhere without being recognised but at home in the UK I can go just about anywhere and not be recognised if I go to a heavy metal place everybody knows me so that's it, if I avoid heavy metal places I can avoid being famous and it's a really nice thing, when people are movie star famous and TV star famous that's a whole different level and then people really want to know what's in your trash and what tattoo you have on your bum. Social media now in my life is mostly a blessing and it's something that is good for me but I come from a place where there was no social media. I come from a place where there was no mobile phones, where there were no laptops, where there was no internet at all. And the only way to communicate what you did was to ask, plead, beg a journalist to come to your show and review your band and hope that they said something favourable about you in a newspaper or magazine. So whatever you did was interpreted by someone else. And as a fan, you had to read between the lines or trust 
a journalist, find out the writers who like the similar kind of things that you do. Now, with social media, I can put a clip of my performance live from tonight on stage while I'm doing it. And people can find that. That's amazing. It's amazing. Maybe it's five people. But it's five people that you wouldn't have got to. And you don't need to ask anybody about it. You don't need anyone's permission. You haven't got to say, please come to uh, and see me. Or we're going to be the next big thing. That's it. You could do it yourself. And so, the world is different. The way that you can promote yourself is different now. But it also asks different questions of you as an artist and these questions are big and very difficult for you to deal with because you have to start facing a reality that is nothing to do with the dream that you started with and nothing to do with the romance that you start out with the idealism that you start out with as a young band, I'll learn to play, I'll get on the stage, everyone will love me because, look, other people on the stage, everybody loves them. That's not how it is at all. What it really is, why does anybody want to know about your band? What's so great about you as an artist that will actually make anybody interested in you? It's not enough that you're a good guitarist. It's not enough that you're a good singer. It's not enough that you write a good song. What is it that's going to really make people want to see you, that want to be a part of your story? Because that's what we have now. You can become a part of the story of the artist. And for me, as an artist, that's an incredible thing. Because I like people. And I like meeting my fans. And uh, my fans will talk to me at a concert. Oh, I really like this part of your voice. Or they'll send me an email. Or on social media, they'll send me a little message on Instagram or Facebook. And say, I really like this part of your voice. I really like that. And and it'll make me think, oh, I never thought about that as an interesting part of my voice or my performance. But it makes me think you know what, maybe I should think more about that. Uh, And it really changes me. And that interaction, that direct relationship that I'm able to have now with fans from around the world is really good. Before, you could only have that with fans locally. When we were starting out in Wolfsbane, we, of course you always met your fans, they were just right there in front of you, who do you think you are, if you're going to ignore people, you know, you don't get very far in the UK, I can tell you, if you start ignoring people, if you're acting like a rock star, you're never going to be one, people will obsessively get themselves involved in their music, their songwriting and their band, now, because of social media, you have a place to express that, that instantly that you never had before with no one's interpretation so whereas before in an interview you could only trust being on the radio or the tv because all the print journalism they would all they could spin it they could misquote you they could make you look a certain way that you're absolutely not or never intended to be take something out of context that you can't do on radio or or in an interview like this but now you can, I can anyway, I don't speak for anybody else. Now I can directly communicate with my fans and say, great show tonight, guys. Thank you so much for that. What an incredible thing. Thank you for your support. Thank you for making it possible for me to continue to live my dream of being a professional heavy metal singer. It's heavy metal. It's not the most popular music in the world anymore. That was the 1980s. You know, now other music is popular. But I, here I am, making my living as a heavy metal singer because my fans can support me. They can find out about me through social media. They don't need to go and buy a magazine or, or look, oh, has it got an interview now? Or anything like that. Sometimes I am in magazines and that's great. But I can communicate with my fans anytime through that social media. And it's very liberating. It gives you... it's. 
liberating and it's also a responsibility that you can't mess about you know you've got to respect people but uh, for me social media as an underground artist which i am i've been in the biggest band in the world it went in heavy metal in, in one of the greatest legends of metal i've been at the very top I loved it, I enjoyed it. Now I'm doing something else. I'm playing to hundreds of people every night. It's and just meaningful to you? Yeah, it, it, well, it's more meaningful in a way. If I'm playing to a, a few hundred people that I can connect with and, and engage with, with my song, that is an incredible experience. And it's because it's smaller, it's not less important because as individuals we've both ex shared this experience and just you know the physics of it when you go to a big concert it's a spectacle that's what you're going to see you're not getting a big connection with the artist you're seeing somebody that big and on a big tv screen 